1950s under McCarthyism. Only here it's a very different set of constraints that are being applied. Another mechanism that's used is through journals. The federal government systematically held conferences inviting editors of scientific journals to come to Washington and various other places to discuss the serious problem of human subjects research. And the journals now, in cooperation with the federal government, uh, now require you to get IRB approval before they'll publish. You cannot publish in most serious journals in the sciences without IRB approval. And in fact, there's even an imprimatur requirement. The journals have set it up as their ethics as, journal, uh, as journals to, requ to require that you state in your article that you have this article had IRB approval. We're back to the 17th century. Why does this matter? Well, of course, if you have an imprimatur, the government can check and IRBs can check up, are people complying? Are they getting permission? So that's the second level, the universities and the, journals and the journals and how they impose this. The third level, of course, are the IRBs themselves. Having established IRBs, let's look at them. Well, the, these are established by the universities. They're really just committees. Their membership is, has to be at least five people. Uh, they consist of faculties and administrators, although increasingly administrators. And they have to have at least one community member. Why a community member judging scholarship? Is this a jury? What's going on here? This is really odd. Um, also, rather curious, they, all the members have to be chosen for, and I quote, sensitivity to community attitudes. So to write, to talk, to read, to publish, you need permission from a group that is sensitive to community attitudes. What happened to the independence of intellectual inquiry? Well, it's just out the window. We'll come back to the IRBs. Let's just complete our survey of the structure. Let's look at the fourth layer in this hierarchy. At the very bottom, of course, are the individuals, the researchers, whether faculty or students. They need to get permission. They need to get a license from their local IRB in order to proceed with any inquiry in human subjects or to publish it. Um, they have to, what they, this means is they have to prepare a proposal. If you want to do research involving human subjects, so-called, you have to prepare a proposal and submit it to the IRB for permission. The IRB will consider it, if you're lucky, at its next meeting. If you're unlucky, three meetings later, thereby delaying a lot of research. Um, and it will discuss whether or not you should be allowed to do this. IRBs can and do modify your research proposal. In fact, 80% of research proposals, as far as the statistics allow one to discern, it's about 80% get modified. That's a huge number. The Star Chamber wasn't like that. The Star Chamber gave thumbs up on mo and its licensors gave thumbs up on most things. This is a high level of control. And of course, amongst the things they do is they can limit publication and they can limit what you talk about. How do they do this? Sometimes they do it directly, but they're usually more subtle. Um, one of the requirements here is you get informed consent from the people you're studying. Now that has its merits, but also you can hide a lot of sins behind an informed consent document. And this is not informed consent of the sort that's involved with going to a doctor. This is a very different, more bureaucratic character. Um, and in fact, the licensing restrictions usually get hidden within the informed consent. So IRBs will often say, oh, we just, we don't make many modifications in anything but the informed consent. And that's good, of course, so don't worry. But of course, the limitations of what you can do with information get hidden in this innocuous sounding document. The sanctions against uncooperative faculty and student I've already mentioned, but some of them are pretty direct and are worth focusing on. Um, you can get an email telling you, you, we hear that you're doing research, stop. You may not do for any further research. Even if the researcher is talking to people, you may not do it. Um, you can be told that you may not publish. Uh, IRBs will sometimes actually interfere with publication. Uh, for example, at the University of Illinois, when an African-American professor of English was about to publish a tenure piece with the Kenyan Review, a distinguished journal. They simply threatened him, if you do not withdraw the article from the Kenyan Review, we'll write to them telling them that you, they may not publish it. And then they called the police on him, too. This, this gets pretty serious. And in fact, at some universities, local campus police are part of the IRBs. Uh, they can also, which is much more common, simply hurt, delay you to death. You apply, and you get, well, we think you need to, you need to adjust this. 
You adjust it, and they say, well, you need to adjust it some more. Um, they basically do this to you give up, and this is deliberate. They know that they can get some feedback from the university and some complaints if they simply say no, so what they tend to do is simply have modification after modification until your grant money runs out. In fact, that's how I ended up writing, working in this field. I'd heard about IRBs. They destroyed the research of friends of mine, they had led scientists I know to stop studying the stuff that would save the lives of children, and I still didn't get involved because you know it's administrative law. I didn't want to do it. I'm not stupid. Why get involved with this stuff? I thought get someone else to do it. <laughs> Until I was walking back from lunch with a colleague at the University of Chicago, and she told me that her entire leave had been wasted by the IRB. They kept on putting her off, delaying her until the leave was over. And this is what you know, faculty value most is time and the research, the time to do the research, in other words. And as the time, by the time we got back, I said, I'm going to take care of this. I haven't yet, but at least I'm writing on it. Um, so the delay is pretty important. Um, and then <clears throat> the net result is that people will just back off from doing research that they can't get permission for. So just to summarize, we have four layers of licensing. The government regulates. The universities cooperate, the IRBs license, and individuals comply. That's our hierarchy. The 17th century has come back to life, which I suppose is not a bad thing if you're an historian, but it's a little depressing as a human being. Um, OK, so let's look, at the, let's look at our second problem here. We looked at the structure. Now let's focus on the constitutional issue. I don't want to get into details of First Amendment law that can get pretty arcane and actually is not terribly relevant here because this is such a simple question of constitutional law. What I'd like to look at here is how the regulations focus on speech in the press and thereby violate the First Amendment. I want to focus on how this is not just licensing of research but licensing of speech in the press. The IRB licensing expressly requires licensing of speech and publication. Allegedly, it's licensing of human subjects research, which sounds awfully like conduct. And if it's conduct, then the First Amendment question gets very complicated because a lot of conduct can be very expressive and nonetheless is not a violation of the First Amendment. But the regulations involved here define human subjects research in terms of speech and publication and, and suppression, in which case we should not be deceived by the word research. The regulations explicitly put it in terms of suppression of speech from the press. And so this is a direct licensing of speech in the press, not licensing of conduct. Now, to, to understand this, I now will finally get to some administrative law. Forgive me, but what I now want to do is actually parse in a technical way some regulations, part of the so-called common rule. Why? Simply to show that the regulations do really do directly require licensing speech in the press. <clears throat> now, IRBs have jurisdiction over so-called human subjects research, but what is that? Well, let's look at the regs. A human subject is defined as, I'm quoting, a living individual about whom an investigator conducting research obtains, first, data through intervention or interaction with individual, or second, identifiable private information. So it's a living person about whom the researcher obtains data through interaction with them, talking with them, looking at them, perhaps extracting blood from them, perhaps something bigger than blood if you're having fun, uh, or second, about whom one obtains identifiable private information, meaning not just talking to them, but nonetheless through some other means, for example, reading about them, I get information about them that somehow allows me to identify who they are. So a human subject is defined in terms of data and information, not in terms of harm. You know, all sorts of laws can be justified, even if they're very intrusive, because of the harm they prevent. But this here, human subject is defined in terms of the acquisition and sharing of knowledge. That's very different. So then, having looked at human subject, let's look at the definition of research. Research is defined by the regs as a systematic investigation, I guess not a sloppy, not a systematic investigation, a systematic investigation designed to produce 
generalizable knowledge. That's a strange phrase, isn't it? Systematic investigation designed to produce generalizable knowledge. Where does this come from? Well, what the regs are doing is they're following the modern scientific method of research. What was developed by Francis Bacon, Galileo, and all those folks in the 17th century, in which knowledge is not particular. Scientific knowledge consists of a theory or a hypothesis. It must be generalized, and so, be, and so you can test whether it applies elsewhere. And second, it has to be then published so that it can be tested. You generalize and you publish it so you can test the generalization against other data. That's the nature of modern science, inquiry, testing, not just flat knowledge and truth, but testing theories, generalizations. So the IRB is therefore, again, not licensed, not harmful research, um, but that which is general enough that it can be published. And in fact, the IRBs understand that that is the purpose and the meaning of this regulatory language, because when IRBs have been asked in studies, what are you doing? How do you determine whether or not something comes within your jurisdiction? They say, we need to license that which the researcher plans to publish or that which is publishable. You can't get closer to a First Amendment violation than this. So research, just to sum up, is defined as a precursor to publication, as an attempt to formulate a publishable theory. In other words, if you're, do, if you're doing that which will lead to publication of this general scientific sort, you're covered. But of course, it's not just hard sciences. It's a new generalization. All academic inquiry is squeezed within the scientific model of knowledge. Well, this has some pretty disturbing results. Notice, to just take an example. Imagine harmful conduct by an academic. Suppose I want to test the effect of tainted tea on my human subjects. You know, if you add some bad bacteria here, what happens if you feed it to them? Will they die? And what if you inject it to, into them? Will that have other effects? This, this could be interesting, won't it, right? So you mad scientist scenario, doing harmful, con harmful conduct. Notice, if I'm doing it in order to publish or in a way that would make it publishable, I need to get a license, I need permission. If I'm doing it in a way that would not lead to publication or is not systematic enough to lead to publication, is not general enough, then it doesn't need a license. The measure isn't the harm, but the publishability. By the same token, if you look at harmless conduct, for example, if I'm doing a social science survey or interviewing somebody or just reading about somebody in a library, for example, if I go to the special collections and read manuscripts about uh, the former president of the university looking through his papers, trying to see what policies he followed, and he'd put it in public records so it's available to everybody, I start reading. Notice I have data that is about him and it's identifiable. That's covered if it is done in a way that would lead to publication. If it's just for my personal satisfaction or gossip, then it's not covered. Publication is the measure of application, not harm. The standard of review used by IRBs confirms the threat to speech. IRBs are expected to weigh the risks and benefits of research, including the risks and benefit of publication. In fact, one of the main harms that IRBs look at is the risk to individuals of having information about them published, in particular having their names published. Um, in doing this, of course, as we saw, IRBs must take into account prevailing community standards. Um, and it's admitted by the government in its reports, it admits that the determinations of risk and benefit are entirely subjective. They say there's some objective boundaries here, but it's very, very subjective. And they encourage this because they want institu institutions to apply community standards and thus vary according to what they see as significant. The harms prevented are often, in fact, the very benefits of freedom of speech, right? What is the use of free speech in a free society if it's not to engage in a certain rough and tumble debate? If it's not actually to tell somebody that you think that they're wrong? If it's not, in fact, to get them in trouble? Um, we use speech powerfully in this society, but IRBs consider a harm the following, legal harm. If you speak in a way that causes legal harm to somebody, why then that's something that should be taken into account in perhaps suppression of speech. If it causes financial harm, if it and these are quotations from government agencies, moral harm, social stigma, if I make you feel bad, uh, causing mental upset. 
So standard example on government websites is if I ask about your sexuality and that makes you feel kind of uncomfortable or if it even causes you to worry, that is a threat of harm and it has to be suppressed. And of course, this means just to give you an example. Uh, uh, I talk a lot of, to a lot of scholars in the breadth of research, among the people I talk to, people studying marriage. And they would generally tell me, we can't study it anymore. What we tend to do is look at court records. Well, why don't you talk to people? We can't talk to people. Then we have to go through the IRB, and they won't let us do it. Um, another area in which or it would delay us too long, we lose our funding. Another example, educational research. It used to be that radical scholarship conducted from universities in this country was done by sending teachers and graduate students in public schools. Can't do that anymore. Just imagine the permissions you need. Uh, imagine just collect doing, looking at uh, uh, t uh, tissue samples in universities. Again, you can't really do this efficiently anymore. It's just too difficult and you might be silenced. Uh, in my own research, I've studied the Ku Klux Klan and its religious prejudices. It was very interesting, transformative for me, changed my view of American history. Among the things I did is try to talk to people who still remembered stuff. That was very useful. But notice, uh, if I actually caused any Klansmen legal harm, financial harm, moral harm, social stigma, mental upset, or even mere worry, I would consider that a great blessing. <laughs> for them, this is grounds for preventing me from publishing and even preventing me from inquiring. There's something very wrong here. Um, and as a result, in fact, many scholars no longer look at living people, they look at the dead. For me, that's very easy, of course, because I like looking at the dead, but for many of my colleagues who like to be more up to date, that's a problem. IRBs, moreover, directly restrict speech and publication. They bar what they call sensitive research, especially stuff on sexuality. They alter scientific method. If you're doing a social science survey and you have the most up-to-date methods, you're in trouble. I know this from friends. They, they, they spend a lot of time studying the best possible statistical methods. They submit it to the IRBs, and the IRBs, because the IRB members, some of them, a few of them study statistics, and they, as remembering what they learned 30 years ago, or misremembering it, they say, oh, you can't do it this way. It's much better to do it the other way. And my friends say, no, 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 no. You're just meant to look at harm, not my method. And they say, no, we can look at method two. You can only do it the following way. In other words, you have to do social science research surveys as of 1970 rather than 2010 or 11. Um, they can rewrite your interview questions. If I want to talk to you, I need to get permission. I need to give them to know what questions I'm going to ask, as if that's how you conduct an interview with everything pre-planned ahead. And they can change the questions to avoid sensitive matters. They can prevent you from talking. They can limit your reading. So for example, unbelievably, looking at census data, public census data, is covered. Why? Notice, you're not talking to an individual. Why would census data be covered? Because in small communities, if you look at census data, you can sometimes figure out who's who. So it's identifiable private information. You need permission. Now, often you'll be, be abbreviated permission, it'll be said be exempt, but you still need permission and you need to register with them and all that. You need permission to look at court records. So increasingly, and this is actually one of my hopes, IRBs increasingly are, are applying these rules to law professors. This is very stupid. This is really stupid. Um, but younger law professors go along with this because they're worried about tenure, they don't want to lose their jobs, they're a little scared. And so they're told, you, we hear you're looking at court records, you can't do this, we're talking to t lawyers, you can't do this without prior permission. They limit your, even the records you keep about research. You're obliged to destroy your records after three years in most instances. What does this imply? This means you can never check for fraud. There's a large amount of scientific fraud. The government doesn't like this. But IRBs actually prevent you from checking up on whether there was fraud. And of course, they limit the publication of results. You often have to strip your data, or even what you learn, of all sorts of identifiable information and other details that actually may turn out to be very important. Um, the suppression of speech goes further. Um, there is what the court calls a chilling effect. And they don't mean the cold. There's a fear of IRBs. And this fear is palpable. People are afraid. I mean, that's not afraid that you're going to, the Stasi is going to come knock on your door in the middle of the night. But they are, academics tend to be a fairly sheep-like crowd. And they're afraid uh, that IRBs will prevent them from doing future research. And they're afraid that they might lose their jobs. And that does happen, just examples of the last few years. Um, so what do they do? They retreat from sensitive topics. They abandon current questions. 
a lot of research just dies in the vine. And of course, as most academics know, most of one's best research is serendipitous. It isn't planned ahead. You wander into something, you inquire and meander, and suddenly you see something and a light goes on and you pursue it. This is not something that can be planned. Well, as you can tell, there are many possible constitutional violations here. It is a sort of smorgasbord of First Amendment violations. If this were a First Amendment class, would linger on each one, tasting it, saying how delicious it was, moving on to the next. One can teach an entire class from this. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I just want to note real content discrimination here against academic and scientific speech. We have a prohibition on offensive speech, that which is too sensitive and might worry somebody and so forth. We have unconstitutionally vague speech, objective standards. We have overbreadth because, of course, licensing by its nature suppresses much talking and publication that will never be harmful. Licensing by its nature requires you get prior permission for everything just in case one or two things turn out to be harmful. I don't want to pay attention to this stuff because although that's the bread and butter of First Amendment law, that's actually small potatoes. The central problem here is licensing. And there's very little doctrine and, and, and precedent on this, of course, because licensing was abandoned in 1695. And most of the First Amendment stuff we have to deal with is this, this, this other stuff. Um, what we have here is a direct requirement of licensing of speech in the press. Um, the direct, the, the regulation, first, the regulations directly impose licensing on attempts to develop publishable generalizations. And second, the regulations directly require IRBs to license the acquisition and sharing of information. Can't get more direct than that. We might ask, well, is there the force of law? Is this being imposed on you in a way that shows government action? Well, yes. There's the condition.